So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the concept of uh, non-local mine. So non-local mine is the idea that the mine is not uh, limited to the confines of the brain and the body. Um, and uh, for a long, long time we thought that uh, the mine was only limited to the brain and the body because it was produced uh, by the brain. But I'm going to present you a series of uh, scientific evidence uh, showing that this view was um, erroneous, wrong, totally wrong. And uh, to begin with, uh, I'll start the presentation by talking about uh, the, what we have called the modern scientific uh, worldview, which was the, a synonym for modern science. And um, after that, I'll present a series of brain imaging uh, experiments done in neuroscience, many of them in my own lab, <clears throat> showing that contrary to uh, what materialist theories of the mind claim uh, our minds can exert a significant impact on brain activity and also elsewhere in the body. And after that I will introduce uh, the concept of non-local mind and I will present uh, a variety of empirical evidence supporting uh, this concept. And uh, following this I will introduce a new theory that I've presented uh, last year. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Consciousness Study. And I will end up the uh, presentation uh, with a few conclusions about the emerging post-materialist paradigm I was talking about uh, earlier. And most of the uh, material I'm presenting in this uh, lecture, you can find uh, this material in two of my previous books, The Spiritual Brain and uh, Brain Wars. And both of these books have been published by HarperCollins. So, uh, I will define uh, at this point some basic concepts that I'm using throughout uh, the presentation. For instance, mind. Uh, mind is, uh, it refers to the mental functions. So it can be perception, emotions, uh, consciousness, uh, reasoning, uh, whatever. And so it's the mental functions and also the, the processes and the events associated to, to these functions. When I'm using the term consciousness here, uh, I'm referring mostly to subjective experience. And it's, uh, so in other words, awareness. And it's an awareness that is related either to the internal world, the mental world, or the so-called external world, outside of the, um, the confines of the body. And I will also use the term psyche. And uh, by psyche, I mean the totality of all the mental processes and events, whether they are conscious or not, doesn't matter. And this includes uh, consciousness and also the notion of self. So let's start with the, uh, the modern scientific uh, worldview. So I'm, I'm referring here to the, the birth of modern science, mostly during the 16th and 17th centuries. And associated with the birth of modern science, uh, there was a series of assumptions, metaphysical assumptions about uh, the natures of reality. So these assumptions are essentially hypotheses about the nature of reality and also about knowledge. And uh, uh, at first, the, they were only hypotheses. But a few centuries after that, during the 19th century, these assumptions, uh, they narrowed, uh, they became uh, an ideological belief system that came to be known as scientific materialism. So I I'm going to review uh, very rapidly some of these uh, metaphysical assumptions. The first one is materialism. So it's the idea that everything in the universe uh, can be explained or reduced to uh, fundamental particles and also the forces of physics. And so everything is seen in terms of physical or material objects, and this includes uh, the brain, which is um, conceived as a system uh, made of uh, particles and also fields, ultimately, at a certain level, at the physical level. Of course, at the cellular level, the biological level, 
It's made of cells and also of chemical messengers. Uh, a closely associated uh, assumption is reductionism. So it's the idea that you can explain uh, all complex systems in the universe uh, as the sum of their parts. So if you want to understand them, you have to go to, you have to examine their ultimate components. And so uh, it is uh, very much uh, associated with uh, another concept that is called upward causation. So for this idea, it means that uh, causation flows only upward from the simpler uh, to the more complex. Applied to the brain, this idea means that you can explain everything in the brain by looking at the components of the brain, for instance, the, the nerve cells, the, the chemical messengers, and ultimately, you could go also at the level of the, uh, the particles. So this means that mind emerges from the brain, which is a very complex uh, system, and thus it's controlled, mind is controlled uh, strictly by electrical and chemical processes. Another uh, assumption is naturalism. So naturalism is the idea that all phenomena in the universe can be explained strictly in terms of natural causes and laws. And by natural here, we mean uh, physical, material. Everything that is non-physical, um, according to this concept, does not exist or is an illusion, a delusion, uh, a byproduct of a misfiring neuron in the brain or something like that. So, for instance, if you take the case of uh, religious, spiritual, and mystical experiences, and I'm using here the uh, acronym RSME to refer to these experiences, well, they are considered a uh, byproduct of brain activities. So they are delusions, in other words. Other assumptions include determinism and also localism. So localism, it's something that is associated with classical physics, not modern physics, not quantum physics, um, because it, this has been invalidated. But um, in classical physics, it means that everything interacts only with its closest neighbors. And th thus, there's no action at a distance uh, that is possible. For determinism, it, uh, it means that every event that is happening, including all our human actions, uh, well, they ca ca cannot happen otherwise because of a certain set of specific conditions. And so this means that there's no uh, free will. So there are many implications uh, for the relationship between uh, mind and brain in view of all these assumptions. So first of all, it means that everything that we experience, uh, our thoughts, emotions, our intentions, um, our spiritual uh, insights, for instance, our consciousness, all of this is either identical with or can be reduced to electrical and chemical events in our brains. So that's the first implication. Second implication, it means that mind is causally powerless. Cannot, our thoughts, our intentions, they cannot have any effect upon our brains and bodies. And also they cannot affect the physical world outside of the confines of uh, the body. And uh, th these uh, uh, assumptions also imply that our mind is encapsulated biologically. So it cannot operate or exert any effect outside the confines of the brain and the body. So this, this was the, uh, the mainstream view during the 19th century, but also during the 20th century in neuroscience. And to a certain extent, I would say that it's still uh, the, the dominant view. And um, this ideology, because it is an ideology, it's not supported by scientific evidence. Uh, it became uh, very dominant in the academic world during the, the, ninth, the 20th century. And because of that, uh, it has slowed down dramatically the scientific study of the mind, consciousness, and also spirituality. And this ideology has led many scientists to neglect 
all the subjective dimension of the human existence and also to downplay uh, the importance of mind, consciousness, and also spirit. One thing that is very important to, to tell uh, when we speak about science is that science is not synonymous with materialism because it is not uh, supposed to be an ideology. So it's, it's sh it should not be committed to any particular ideology, whether social, uh, political, religious. Uh, it's not about dogmas or beliefs or ideologies. Because first and foremost, it's, it's a method of investigating uh, reality, nature. And it's, it's supposed to be non-dogmatic, open-minded. This is very uh, important. Um, so uh, even uh, the, this is the ideal version of science. But unfortunately, uh, throughout centuries, uh, Science has become, has become, um, uh, unfortunately, synonym with reductive materialism for a lot of scientists and also for many people in society and also in the media. And many people still equate materialism with uh, science, but it, it has nothing to do with this. Materialist theories of the mind claim that uh, the mind does not have any impact on the, the brain and the body. I'm going to present you a series of neuroscientific evidence showing that this is uh, absolutely wrong, that mind exerts a very significant impact on what's happening uh, in the brain. And um, this question has been studied by um, psychology, various areas of psychology, like social psychology, uh, psychology of perception, and so on and so forth. And, so that you have tons of studies showing that our thoughts, our intentions, can causally affect what we do, how we think, um, our behaviors and attitudes. And if you take these psychological factors like beliefs or motivations, desires, intentions, you, uh, the, you can predict to a large extent the behavior of human beings. And you can also understand uh, why they behave the way they do. So the, the, these psychological factors have a very high explanatory and predictive uh, value in psychological studies. And so th this means that in reality, we're, we're conscious, intentional beings. Uh, we're also uh, proactive agents of experience. So we're not simply undergoers of experience uh, or biological robots totally determined by our genes and our neurons or our chemical messengers. And so these psychological studies, uh, they imply that we can greatly influence what's happening in the brain. Here's the first uh, example. Study we did at the beginning of the, at the turn of the millennium. It was the, the first study done on em what we call emotion regulation. Emotion regulation is the, the, um, the capacity to uh, influence what's it, what is happening to us uh, from an emotional perspective uh, in terms of the intensity of the uh, emotion uh, experience, in terms of the, um, the kind of experience, the emotion experience, and so on and so forth. In this case, what we did is we used uh, a, a scanner, a functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner, and we presented to uh, 10 healthy uh, university students erotic film clips in the first conditions. Because we did, we, uh, based on previous findings, we knew that the, these kind of um, film clips would activate very strongly a part of the brain that we call the limbic system, or it's a synonym, if you will, of the, the emotional brain. And uh, so effectively, the, the uh, the subjects were lying down in a scanner. They, they were wearing goggles connected to a computer. And we were presenting the, the film excerpts. And so what we are seeing uh, up there is a strong, very robust activation in key components of uh, the limbic system, like the um, amygdala, the hypothalamus, uh, another region called the anterior temporal pole. Uh, 
so that was the first condition. In the second condition, we ask our subjects to become detached observers of the film clips themselves, but also of their own subjective experience. So, we, uh, so it's, it's, uh, Joe uh, was talking earlier about um, metacognition. So this is a good example of metacognition. And it's very close to what people do when they practice mindfulness meditation. And what happened, and these people did not have any experience at all with mindfulness meditation. After only a few minutes of practice, all the very intense activity in the limbic system was gone. It vanished completely. And their subjective experience was changed also uh, dramatically. Uh, we did another study using a different brain imaging technology, uh, a scanner we call positron emission tomography, or PET. And this time we were measuring the activity of a chemical messenger in the brain, very important, serotonin. And serotonin is uh, involved in all sorts of functions, but it's the key chemical messenger involved in, um, in the emotional life, emotional regulation. And um, it's a chemical messenger that is targeted when people are suffering from major depression. So the antidepressant anti drugs target mainly this uh, chemical system. So in this study, we asked uh, our people, our subjects, to simply uh, remember and relive the appius episode of their lives. And uh, we were scanning them for about 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, we saw a major, very significant increase in terms of the production and liberation, release of uh, serotonin in ver key regions of the uh, limbic system, the emotional part of, of the brain. We did exactly the, the, the reverse condition. So we asked these people to uh, remember and to relive the saddest episode uh, of their lives. And we, uh, we measured exactly the reverse phenomenon. So there was a significant decrease in terms of the uh, production and release of serotonin within only a few minutes. So you can imagine what is happening in the brain if you are entertaining negative thoughts and uh, memories for n not only minutes, but hours, weeks, months, even years. Now, there are, we, we, uh, we know that there's a very strong relationship between negative thoughts and stress and the development of dementias like Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it becomes a risk factor, an important risk factor. We did another study about neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the capacity of the, uh, of the brain, the human brain, to change it, its structure uh, by creating either new neurons or new synaptic junctions, the, the point of contact between neurons in the brain. And uh, it can also be the creation of new neural uh, circuits. In this case, uh, we examined uh, what was happening in the brain of uh, 12 women suffering from very intense uh, spider phobia. So at the beginning of our study, these women were not even able to look or touch at colored pictures of spiders uh, in a booklet. And so we scanned them, and while we were scanning them, we were presenting to them uh, uh, film excerpts of huge spiders in motion. All of them had uh, intense panic reaction, as ex expected. What is very interesting, so you can see that this, this was the, the region of the uh, amygdala uh, activated, and the amygdala is a, a very key component of the limbic system. It's involved in the... Um, evaluation, the appraisal of the emotional valence of an event or a stimulus. Uh, the, the, the therapy consisted in uh, four uh, sessions, four weekly sessions. And uh, what we did during these sessions is that we invited an expert from the Insectarium of Montreal to give information to our phobics about spi the, the spi spiders. What are their cognitive capacities, their perceptual capacities, and so on and so forth. And so it became very obvious for uh, our phobics that 
uh, it was not possible for spiders to create very complex uh, scenarios to attack human beings on purpose, for instance. Uh, it was very clear, based on the information provided by the uh, expert from the insectarium, that this was not the case at all, that the, their perceptual capacities uh, were very limited and so on and so forth. And so after four sessions, four weeks, all our, of our subjects were able to uh, hold in their hand a giant tarantula. So it was very spectacular from a psychological point of view. And neurally, in the brain, we presented to them, again, a series of um, film excerpts of spiders in motion. And this time, there was no activation in the amygdala region, no activation also in the region of the hippocampus, which is involved in memory. Because in the case of the, the, those women, all of them have had very uh, traumatic experiences when they were young. So their, the phobia was connected to traumatic memories. But uh, after therapy, even though they were still conscious of these memories, um, they didn't have any reaction in the emotional portion of the brain. So what happened is that there was a major reorganization of the functioning of these uh, regions and also probably of certain neural networks um, and also chemical uh, reorganization, for sure. Another uh, example showing uh, the power of mind over what's going on in the brain is the placebo. And the placebo, well, it's based on the belief in the efficacy of a fake treatment. So it can be uh, saline water, distilled water, a sugar pill, and uh, plac the placebo effect is involved in all kinds of treatment, all forms of therapy, including surgery. So there was a very interesting study uh, done at uh, Baylor University in Houston, Texas, and it was about the uh, arthroscopy for the osteoarthritis of the knee. And before the, uh, the study, most of the, uh, the patients were walking uh, with a cane. They had to walk with a cane. So it was quite serious. Um, and the, the placebo intervention consisted only in a small of in incision. And after uh, the placebo treatment, uh, all of the patients were able to walk correctly without a cane, and some of them were even able to uh, play basketball for a long period of time, which is very uh, impressive. Another very uh, interesting study was done at, by neurologists at the University of British Columbia, uh, and uh, it was very interesting because the study was done with uh, Parkinsonian patients. And in Parkinson's disease, there's a, a destruction, progressive destruction of the nerve cells, the neurons in the brain producing a chemical messenger that is called dopamine. Dopamine is, is involved in all sorts of functions, including reward, but it's also the key uh, neurotransmitter in motor activity, motor control. So in the case of the, these patients, they had a destruction of their neurons uh, that was about 70%, the neurons producing the dopamine. And so th this means that they were clinically very much impaired. They were experiencing a lot of rigidity, tremors, and so on and so forth. The neurologist told the, uh, the group of patients that the... Uh, Perhaps there was a, a new drug for Parkinson's disease, very pro promising. In reality, uh, they injected them only uh, saline water, distilled water. And uh, to uh, the patients who most believe in this fake treatment, they started to produce and release dopamine in their brains in a level comparable to, to what you see in young, healthy people for a certain period of time. And at the same time, uh, they were experiencing um, a significant increase clinically, so they had less rigidity, less tremors. And this lasted for a certain period of time, but after a while, uh, 
because of the ethics of the research, you have to tell your patients whether they were uh, belonging to the placebo group or not. And when you do that, you l most of the time you lose the placebo effect. Uh, you can train your, uh, your m also your brain uh, by training your mind uh, using all sorts of meditative practices. And so when you do that, you can enhance, now we, we have tons of studies showing that you can enhance the uh, activity of brain regions involved in uh, attention, um, the regulation of emotion, and also compassion and empathy. Here's an example of a study we did in our uh, lab. And we were using uh, very uh, emotionally laden pictures. It's a, a database used by emotion uh, researchers around the world. It's called the International Effective Picture System. And all these pictures are, are real. They're not fake. And the, uh, so we know in advance that they, they can induce very strong emotional reactions. And uh, we compared begin beginners with experts at m mindfulness meditation. And you can see here that in the beginners, uh, they, they just had uh, begun b about a week before the actual experiment, there was very strong a response in the amygdala region, which is ex expected. But if you take the case of the experienced meditators, you don't see any activation. And these people had meditated for uh, a minimum of 3,000 hours, which means that uh, when you do that, you completely rewire your brain, you modify the activity of uh, brain regions involved in all sorts of functions, and you create uh, new neural circuits. Another uh, technique that allows you to influence what's happening in your brain is neurofeedback. Uh, so so you, using neurofeedback, you can learn to control the activity of brain regions uh, associated to uh, emotion regulation, cognitive functions like attention, memory, for instance. And you do that simply by controlling the electrical activity of your brain. So for instance, um, you have a few electrodes on the scalp, and the electrodes uh, is recording your electrical activity in specific regions, and this uh, electrical activity that is registered by the electrodes, it is coupled to um, a video game with sounds. So you can uh, see the, the, the subject can see the video game on the computer screen. And whenever you are in the right zone, the zone, um, the optimal zone, the, uh, the game is on, but each time you're getting out of the, the zone, the video game stops. So that gives you a feedback, and that's how you learn when you're in the zone and where you're not. And by using this kind of procedure, you can learn very rapidly. Most people can learn to control electrical activity uh, very quickly. And when you are, sub and it's, so it's very useful for people also suffering from various uh, neurological disorders, including uh, hyperactivity and um, attention deficit disorder, for instance. Epilepsy also responds very well and uh, many other uh, disorders. And uh, by doing this, you can change, you can alter very rapidly the functioning of uh, your brain activity, but you can also change the functioning and also the structure of your brain. This is a good illustration here in red. What you're seeing is that incre it's an increase in gray matter. So it's an increase in terms of the new nerve cells, new neurons. And this was uh, after only a few months of practice with neurofeedback. Uh, this was done in um, psychology students at the University of Montreal. It's also possible now to use another uh, technique to, do, uh, to use a scanner, a resonance imaging scanner. And you can now learn to, to self-regulate uh, the activity of very specific regions of your brain. So we can isolate a, a specific region like this one, and we can ask our participants in our studies to either up-regulate or down-regulate the activity of uh, this given region, and they can learn to do that uh, quite rapidly, uh, usually. Uh, so uh, the mind is 
very powerful because it can really transform our brain, not only in terms of the functioning of the various brain regions, but also the, the structure, the gray matter, the white matter. Uh, we know that the brain is connected to all the major physiological systems in the body, the endocrine system, the immune system, the cardiovascular system, and so on and so forth. And if you put all these systems together, it uh, constitutes what we call the psychosomatic network. And so the, these uh, physiological systems, the, for instance, the immune system, the endocrine system, and the nervous system, they uh, communicate uh, constantly uh, through chemical messengers uh, that could be considered as informational substances. And uh, now we know that if you do mental imagery or if you're using uh, relaxation or meditation, um, positive emotions also, you will change, you will affect the functioning of the immune system because of this connection between the central nervous system and the brain and the immune system. It's the same thing for the endocrine system. And now, uh, in this concept of a psychosomatic network, we should include also gene expression because um, uh, epigenetics is showing increasingly uh, that we can uh, influence, for instance, genes uh, involved in emotions, uh, stress, um, and also in uh, all sorts of behaviors. And uh, some years ago, I proposed a model, uh, an hypothesis that was called the psychoneural transduction mechanism. So it's the idea that uh, what's happening at the mind, all the, the mental events, uh, whether they are conscious or not, doesn't matter. They are these events, these mental events, a thought, for instance, or a feeling, the, they are translated into uh, different forms of information, uh, wh which are uh, other types of neural events at different levels of the brain. So it can be at the level of the cells, can be at the level of the chemical messengers, can be at the level of neural circuits. And these um, resulting neural events, in turn, they, uh, are translated also into other forms of information uh, with regard to the psychosomatic network, for instance, in the endocrine system or in the immune system. And this figure summarizes uh, what I'm uh, explaining here. So everything that is happening at this level can be a thought, beliefs, emotion. They are translated uh, automatically, whether you are conscious or not. They are translated electrically in the brain and also chemically in the brain. And since the brain is connected to all the phys major physiological systems of the body, this means that everything that is happening here at that level will have an impact at that level automatically. And like I said before, we should even include uh, now gene expression in this whole uh, system. So this is, this is what we could call the local mind. What I presented in terms of uh, empirical evidence, it's, the, it's the, or the, the, uh, the effect of the psyche upon the brain and the body. But there's also other aspects of the mind that are non-local. Non-local means uh, not limited or confined to uh, the brain and the body. And the first category of phenomena supporting this view of a non-local mind, uh, it's the, the so-called psi phenomena, which are uh, studied by parapsychology. And one key question about that raised by skeptics uh, of these phenomena, and with good reason, it's the magnitude of these phenomena. Because uh, how do we know that these phenomena are real if they are usually very weak? And in order to evaluate the magnitude of these phenomena, we can use what uh, statisticians call meta-analysis. So we can combine several studies, hundreds or even thousands of studies together. And this allows researchers to evaluate, to assess the true magnitude of uh, a given phenomenon. And uh, uh, if you don't do that, then uh, and you have uh, very small studies with a very restricted number of participants, then you cannot 
be able to uh, evidence certain types of uh, phenomena. Skeptics also rise, uh, they, they raise very often the, the, the problem of what they call the file drawer. So this uh, idea refers to the notion that perhaps hypothetical studies would have been performed by scientists, but they were not published because they produced uh, negative results and uh, the scientists did not bother to publish them. Uh, but when you're using meta-analysis, it's possible to calculate how many file drawer studies uh, you would need to cancel or nullify the positive results that have been published to date. If we take the case of telepathy, for instance, the mental exchange of information between people. Uh, during the last decades, there's a condition or a protocol that has been used that is called the Gansfeld procedure. And it's a, a sensory deprivation technique uh, which leads to very rapidly to an altered state of consciousness so people uh, are isolated visually, they don't see the uh, external world, uh, and they are listening to a white noise. And uh, using this kind of approach, it's very easy for participants to enter into uh, an altered state of consciousness. And in these kind of experiments, so you, you have two participants. You have uh, the sender, and the sender is focusing his attention on uh, images, for instance. And you have also the, uh, the receiver. And the targets uh, during the last decades have been mostly uh, audio-video clips uh, taken from either uh, motion pictures or uh, TV shows. And before that, static pictures uh, were used. So researchers have done meta-analysis to evaluate the true magnitude of these phenomena because skeptics have been saying for decades that this phenomenon does not exist for real. But when you combine the results of thousands of studies together, you obtained uh, odds against chains of 29 uh, quintillion to one, for instance. So it's very clear that this phenomenon exists. However, the effects, when you look at the individual studies, are usually weak, and it's very hard to control that. Uh, you don't find many uh, subjects who are able to control that at will. But the, the, uh, the researchers who did this meta-analysis, they also f found out that the number of negative experiments required to invalidate this finding was over 2,000. And this was very unrealistic because there were only a handful of researchers doing experiments in this field. Uh, other researchers have uh, attempted to examine whether it's possible for humans to influence physical system. And one of these systems is uh, what we call a random number generator. So it's an electronic circuit that produced thousands of random uh, coin flips per second, if you will. But rather than heads and tails, this machine uh, produced sequences of random bits, either zeros or ones. And we ask simply participants to uh, mentally influence the RNG, uh, the output of the, the device, so that produce either more zeros than ones or vice versa. And at, at Princeton University, uh, during the, the 70s and the 80s and also the 90s, they were conducting a research program about this. And uh, so they, in one meta-analysis, they reviewed 12 years of experiments with this device. And this in, uh, analysis involved over 800 experiments. And in these experiments, they were, the experimenters were asking the participants to either try to influence the uh, RNG output to drift above chance or below chance. So when it drifts above chance, that's the kind of graph you obtain. Uh, below chance, that, that's what you see, and this is uh, according to uh, random uh, activity, chance, pure chance. So the, the results of this uh, meta-analysis produce odds against chance of 35 trillion uh, to one. Again, this was very significant. So uh, it seems that human beings can have the, um, can influence at a distance not only physical systems, but also other living systems. 
So it can be uh, other humans. It can be also uh, enzymes, can be uh, blood cells also, this has been demonstrated. Some, in some experiments, plants were used, so the growth rate of these plants were uh, measured. And at the Bain Science Foundation, they conducted a research program about this for a number of years, and they did another uh, meta-analysis of their own experiments, and the odds against chance uh, were more than uh, 100 trillion uh, to one. And f with humans, when they were asking humans to influence other humans, they were asking them to send them uh, emotionally, uh, emotional images mentally, either positive or negative. And what the uh, experimenters were measuring was the, what we call the electrodermal um, activity. So it's the electrodermal activity, it's the electrical activity of the, the skin, which is an index of uh, emo emotional responsivity, emotional response. Another category of um, phenomenon that supports this idea of non-local mind, it's near-death experiences. So near-death experiences, uh, they refer to um, complex mental experience that happened uh, close to death or uh, during clinical death in some cases. And uh, during these episodes, you have enhanced mental activity. So the experiencers retain uh, their faculties of perception, consciousness, thinking, memory, emotions. Uh, but not only that, the, the, the mental activity is even enhanced compared to uh, normal cognition or emotion. And these uh, experiences are, can be triggered by a variety of factors, either cardiac arrest, uh, electrocution, can be complications also from surgery or anesthesia, uh, severe blood loss uh, during or after delivery. And um, many studies have been uh, done, statistical studies, to measure the incidence of these experiences in the uh, population, at least in the West. And they, they reveal that during the last 50 years, more than 25 million people have had a near-death experience. And uh, studies also uh, show that it's an experience that is not involved by, it's not influenced by either the socioeconomic status or the gender, the race, uh, religious affiliations or beliefs, or even the level of education. And these experiences are uh, characterized by a number of core features. The first one is the out-of-body experience. And it's a very important component of this experience because it's the only one that can be uh, corroborated externally or independently. Uh, in the sense that some experiencers can have access of informa to, uh, to information while they, are, they have the impression of leaving their physical body. And this information uh, that they memorize, this information can be later on corroborated by, for instance, members of the, the medical staff. All the other components of the narrative experience are um, subjective internal, so you cannot scientifically verify or confirm their existence because they are based on self-reports. They include feelings of peace and joy, uh, a passage through a, re a dark region or a tunnel very often. Uh, you have also an encounter with deceased relatives and friends and also an encounter with a light or a being of light that um, radiates complete uh, love, unconditional love, and so these uh, experience, these experiences have uh, a transformative impact from a psycho-spiritual point of view. So very uh, often they will lead to uh, a major change in terms of values and attitude toward death. Most experiencers do not fear uh, death anymore after that. Um, this uh, uh, kind of experience also brings a new sense of purpose and meaning in life. There's increase in terms of spirituality, but very often uh, a decrease in terms of religious affiliation. There's an appreciation also uh, of nature, and uh, there's a change in terms of the personal relationship of the experiencer with a uh, high power or God, if you will. And uh, there's also a change in attitude toward the self 
and also toward other people. One instance of NDE that is par particularly interesting to a neuroscientist like myself is the cardiac arrest, because when there's a cardiac arrest, there's a, a, a loss of blood flow to the brain. It stops. And then you, if you're measuring the electrical activity of the brain using what we call electroencephalography or EEG, you'll see that the, um, the activity will vanish after usually 10 to 20 seconds. Uh, so you, you, you cannot measure or detect electrical activity in the brain anymore after that. And so the brain regions that are, according to mainstream uh, neuroscience, supposed to produce the higher mental functions, they're no longer active in that condition. And uh, yet, during the last 13 or 14 years, uh, there have been, I think, um, five different studies conducted either in the United States, uh, in UK, also in the Netherlands. And these studies have documented over 100 patients who have been uh, consciously, uh, conscious, aware, who were able to perceive while they were in a state of cardiac arrest. And uh, to come back to the out-of-body uh, experience component of NDE, it, this is a very, very important because, as I said before, the experiencers can provide veridical information. Veridical means that the information that they are reporting coincides with uh, reality. Um, so uh, this is an important component for NDE researchers, of course. And uh, it's important to, to tell that to know that uh, in uh, NDEs, usually the OBE perception, the veridical OBE perception, uh, they greatly outweigh uh, the perception that are inaccurate uh, because it's above, the, the, the rate of uh, accuracy is above 90%. So uh, this field of research, and especially during cardiac arrest, these experiences have a lot of implications because the they challenge directly the materialist theories of the mind. Uh, and very often the, the, the skeptics, the, the materialist uh, scientists and, and thinkers will say that, well, it's, perhaps it's because the EEG allows us to uh, record the activity of neurons only in the cortical region, the, the upper portion of, of the brain, which is true. Uh, uh, and it's very difficult using this technology to record activity coming from the lower portions of the brain, like the, the brain stem, for instance. Uh, however, uh, all the studies indicate that the uh, electrical activity in the brain directly associated with all the complex functions, memory, perception, uh, awareness, emotions, and so on and so forth, uh, this activity comes from the upper portion of the brain, the cortical level. And clearly, during cardiac arrest, this activity is absent. Another avenue of research uh, suggesting uh, or supporting non-local mind, it's uh, a new field of neuroscience and spirituality. It's, it's uh, relatively young because the first studies were performed about 30 years ago. And it's a field of research at the crossroad of uh, spirituality, psychology, and neuroscience. And the goal of this field of research is to explore the neural correlates of RSMEs, religious, spiritual, and mystical experiences. And when I'm talking about correlate, I'm talking about phenomena that are uh, associated with uh, other phenomena at the mind level. So whenever there is something that changes in terms of mental activity, for instance, a spiritual experience, you look at things that are changing also at the brain level. That's what we call correlates. Uh, one thing that is important to say also about this is that uh, these experiences, these spiritual experiences, these, they are pretty much universal and they refer to a very basic dimension of human existence. They've always been reported across all cultures and uh, like the NDEs, they often lead to psycho-spiritual transformation. You may have heard about uh, neurotheology, which is a related uh, concept or field 
But neurotheology is uh, it's a sub-discipline of neuroscience, and the people in this field, uh, they are uh, trying to provide uh, neural or brain explanations of these experiences. Uh, but it's a reductive and a very materialistic uh, enterprise, because the basic assumption of this field for most researchers is that all these experiences are simply created by the brain. So in other words, they are delusions. And so these researchers try to pathologize our SMEs. And so they are trying to explain these, um, to explain away these experiences as the result of mental disorders, and which are the product of brain disorders. And, uh, but in reality, uh, there are lots of studies showing that these experiences, our SMEs, they are associated with better uh, mental health. And uh, it's also true that in the vast majority of people having these experiences, uh, RCMEs are not associated with pathological brain activity. And about this issue, uh, the Hungarian psychiatrist Thomas Schach wrote something very interesting. He said that if you talk to God, you are praying for psychiatrists because he's a psychiatrist. But if God talks to you, you have schizophrenia. He was a very spiritual man himself, I have to say. <laughs> so, uh, to go back to this concept of neurotheology, uh, we have to be careful because when you say that something is a correlate or is associated with something else, it doesn't mean that it's the neural correlate or as the neural association that creates the phenomena that we are investigating. So, in other words, correlation does not entail causation or identity. Uh, and when we do studies in this field, it's also important to remember that the external reality of a transcendental a principle, God, for instance, of course it cannot be proved or disproved simply by identifying the, uh, the correlates of uh, these experiences. And also, when you identify these correlates, it does not really diminish or depreciate the, the meaning and the value of these experiences. Uh, Sir uh, Alistair Hardy, uh, who was working in Oxford uh, in the 60s and 70s, he wrote a very interesting book called The Spiritual Nature of Man, and he conducted uh, a study across UK about these experiences. He was interested to determine the, the triggers, the main triggers of these experiences. So he received over 4,000 letters and, uh, from people uh, from all sorts of uh, socioeconomic uh, level. And so the, the most common triggers for these experiences are depression or despair. Uh, second, prayer or meditation or contemplation. And third, natural beauty. Uh, psychedelic drugs uh, came uh, after that, but they were also uh, considered to be uh, a significant trigger. And so these experiences have consequences, positive consequences, like NDEs. So you, you find exactly the same thing. So you have people who have these experiences, uh, following their experiences, the, the, uh, to transcend their own sense of personal identity. They don't identify uh, themselves anymore to their small self. And they have an, an enhanced sense of connection to and also unity with others uh, in the world. Uh, they have a different sense of purpose and also meaning. And like I said before, there have been studies of these people. And uh, the studies have revealed that people who have these experiences, they score lower on uh, scales measuring psychopathology. And they, they, and they have better, uh, they score higher on scales measuring psychological well-being. And they are also, they have lower rates of crime and addiction. And they are less likely also to engage in uh, antisocial behavior. So 30 or 40 years ago, neurologists, a group of neurologists proposed that all these experiences are simply delusions created by a misfiring temporal lobe in the brain. This is the, the part of the brain that we call the, the temporal lobe. This is an, an external view. 
And they were saying that because in some cases when epileptic patients have the, their seizures localized within this region, they will report religious or spiritual experiences. But it does happen very rarely, about 1% uh, of the time. So the, these neurologists propose that all the great religious figures across history were suffering from temporal lobe epilepsy. St. Paul, for instance, or Joan of Arc, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Lisieux, that you see here. But uh, there was a neurologist, an expert, a world-leading expert on epilepsy at the University of Chicago, John Hughes. So he conducted very detailed uh, investigation of all the writings of these uh, religious figures, and he found no evidence that this was indeed the case, that they were suffering from temporal lobe epilepsy. And also we have to remember that most people who have uh, RSMEs, they're not epileptics at all. Their temporal lobe is functioning perfectly. And very few epileptics, like I said, uh, report these experiences during the seizures, about 1%. So uh, despite of this, there's a famous Canadian neuroscientist, Michael Persinger. And uh, Persinger is a self-avowed atheist, materialist. And he proposed that religious beliefs are simply an artifact of the brain. And that all these experiences are um, created by micro-seizures in the temporal lobe region. He proposed that several decades ago. And so he reasoned that if this is indeed the case, then it should be possible to stimulate electromagnetically the temporal lobes. And it would be possible uh, in doing that to induce these experiences. And so he created an helmet in his lab that was called later on by journalists around the world the God helmet. But there's a lot of problems with uh, his approach because he, he, has, uh, he was uh, most of the time in his studies but very biased in terms of who he was recruiting to participate in his study. So for instance, he was uh, giving uh, suggestibility scales to measure the level of suggestibility of potential subjects. And he recruited mostly peop stu students who were most suggestible. And he were giving them higher grades also if they accepted to participate <laughs> in the experiments. We, we discovered that years after that. He, he never used also a double blind protocol uh, approach. So he knew in advance, or his technicians knew in advance uh, it, whether the subjects were receiving the, the, the true, the genuine stimulation or not. And this was a serious bias. He never also attempted to check with brain imaging whether his helmet was truly inducing, changing the activity of the temporal lobes. And the worst problem is that no genuine RSMEs were reported. Uh, the only thing that was reported by a number of people was a sense presence in his lab while they were doing the, uh, the stimulation. But it was ne not necessarily related to uh, spirituality. And uh, some years ago, a research psychologist in Sweden attempted to replicate uh, his findings or what he was claiming to find. And uh, so they used exactly the same equipment, which was the helmet was coming from Persinger's lab, but they used this time uh, a, a double blind protocol uh, randomly, and also the, the uh, control, they did not control for suggestibility. There was no bias in terms of the recruitment of the subjects and they didn't find any uh, result, any positive result. Does, that doesn't mean that the, the famous temporal lobe is not involved in spiritual uh, states and experiences. So to, in, in, in order to de de determine this, uh, some years ago, uh, we decided to uh, scan Carmelite nuns uh, from a convent in Montreal. And uh, when we talk of uh, mystical experiences, we re refer mainly to the, the following. A sense of union with either God or a transcendental pr uh, principle. A se sense of having touched the ultimate ground of reality. Uh, these experiences are very hard to communicate with uh, conventional language. They are beyond space and time, and very often they are associated with feelings of peace, joy, uh, also unconditional love. 
So the, uh, in our experiment, the, the, we used also a scale to measure the intensity of the, the mystical experiences. And so the, the nuns scored very highly on a number of items, uh, items uh, on this scale. So subjectively, they felt something mystical while we were scanning them. With the uh, fMRI scanner, what we saw is that there was indeed an activation, the famous uh, temporal lobe uh, region, but there was also activation in many other brain regions. And these brain regions are normally associated with all sorts of functions, like uh, awareness, positive emotions, uh, also the representation of the body uh, within the physical space, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a very complex uh, experience. We also used EEG to measure what was happening electrically in the brain during these experiences. And we saw a lot of very slow waves, theta waves, uh, mostly. Like uh, in some experiments, when they tested the Zen masters, for instance, it was very similar. So these uh, findings means that there's no single God spot in the brain, it, because uh, it's much more complicated than that, uh, because these experiences are very complex. The, uh, they are multidimensional. They involve, like I said, perception, uh, self-awareness, emotions, and so on and so forth. So there are several brain regions and circuits that are associated or that mediate these, uh, these mystical states. And so uh, a certain portion of the empirical evidence I have presented uh, up to date have uh, led me to propose a, th a new theory uh, that was published last year, and I call that theory of psychoelementarity. It was published in the Journal of Consciousness Studies. And there are four different postulates. The first one is that psyche is pr primordial and irreducible to matter. It means psyche is as primordial as matter, energy, information, and space-time. If you don't, for instance, consciousness, which is a, key, a core component of the psyche, if you don't have consciousness, you do not experience uh, anything internally or externally, and there's no universe. Uh, you don't have the perception that there's a universe. And so, in order to understand all phenomena, either at the micro-physical level, or um, at, a, uh, at a macro level, the level of behavior, you need this construct, psyche. You need to take into account this uh, concept. It's also a fundamental force of nature. Because, why? Because it has the capacity to induce change, cause change. And it, it's fundamental because it allows us to understand all sorts of phenomena at various levels of organization. Uh, it's also a force because it's, it's the means through which we can transform, construct uh, our world. Uh, yet, like gravity, for instance, or dark energy, it cannot be measured directly, only uh, inferred. And as I showed, uh, psyche exerts a tremendous impact over what's happening in the brain, also in, in, in the body. And the uh, impact of the psyche is not limited to the body, as I showed, it can exert an influence at a distance also. Uh, and so this means that what we call psyche and the physical world, they are deeply interconnected. They, uh, uh, they interact because they are interconnected. They are not separated, uh, because if they would be separated, there would be no interaction possible. And so they are intercorrect, interconnected, I think, because they represent complementary aspects of a single reality, of a, an undividable whole. And this has been proposed uh, before by physicist uh, Wolfgang Pauli, for instance, David Baum, and also psychiatrist uh, Carl Jung. And it is because of this deep interconnection that the psyche is able to influence physical and biological phenomena, <clears throat> and also other human beings. And uh, this interconnectedness does not seem to rest on quantum entanglement. Some people have proposed that, but 
uh, in quantum physics, non-local connections between entangled particles, they do not involve transfer of information. In the case of um, the interaction between uh, the psyche and the body or physical systems, there is uh, an information exchange. And also in quantum physics, they don't take into account mental phenomena like attention, emotion, beliefs. They don't have anything to do with this. Um, so we have to go beyond quantum physics to be able to understand uh, these phenomena. Finally, the, uh, the psyche is not produced by the brain, uh, clearly, because uh, as I showed, during cardiac arrest, conscious mental activity is still possible. And also, it's, uh, it's possible for the, the, uh, the human psyche to exert influence at the distance on physical systems and biological systems. So what does the brain do, uh, actually? It acts as an interface and as a filter. It acts, for me, as uh, an interface, a relay station for the, the, the psyche. It also acts as a filter. And so normally, it, re it re limits the access to extended forms of consciousness. And this was proposed uh, before by uh, William James also uh, and the philosopher Henri Bergson. So we can use the, analogy, the TV analogy to understand the relationship between mind and brain. So the, the, a TV set receives broadcast signals, electromagnetic uh, fields, and it will convert them into images uh, and sound. And damage to the electronic component, if you damage the electronic component of your TV set, you will induce a distortion of either the image or the sound or both. Uh, and because the capacity of the TV set to receive and decode the electromagnetic signals is impaired. So uh, that does not mean that the broadcast signals and the program are produced by the TV set. So you can use the same analogy with regard to my brain uh, relationship. And so the, the, the brain acts also as a filter. And usually it restricts, it allows us only to experience a narrow portion of reality. Uh, but the good news is that this filter function of the brain can be altered in a number of ways. Uh, through, for instance, uh, psychedelic uh, substances, through spiritual practices, sensory deprivation, uh, ND, of course, uh, can severely alter uh, this relationship. So normally, it's like if we're, we are always tuning to the same frequency, if we use the electromagnetic spectrum as an analogy. If you take the case of human beings, for instance, that we can see only in a very restricted uh, uh, range of frequencies and other species have access to uh, the ultraviolet, which is not possible for human. Some birds do that, insects uh, as well. But when you alter the state of consciousness and you modify uh, the electrical activity and the chemical activity of your brain, then you can have access to a wider range of frequencies. And one way to do that is to synchronize brainwave activity with sounds that are embedded uh, within uh, soundtracks, for instance. And using this kind of approach, uh, you, you will induce what we call uh, a brainwave entrainment. So if you pre you're presenting, for instance, sounds uh, whose frequency corresponds to theta waves, very slow frequencies, uh, a frequency of around 4 hertz, for instance. You do that for a number of minutes, uh, even though uh, the people cannot detect consciously the presence of these sounds within the, the soundtrack, the brain can. And there will be an entrainment response, and so the, the brain of the, uh, the people listening to the music will start producing much more uh, theta waves. And by using this kind of approach, uh, you can produce all sorts of things, very interesting things. Uh, I've been working with this approach for a few years now, doing st experimental studies, and it's possible to induce very intense altered state of consciousness and very strong spiritual experiences uh, by using this, uh, this kind of approach. And based on that, I've created a workshop that I called The Inner Connection, a conscious uh, recreation. So all these evidence that I've showed you uh, during my talk lead to uh, an emerging post-materialist paradigm. Um, 
we have to remember the history of science. For a long, long time, scientists were convinced, believed that the sun revolved around the Earth, or that power heavier than uh, the air flight was absolutely impossible. Now they are saying, or they've been saying for a century, that the brain creates the mind, and that when the brain dies, consciousness dies too. But these things are simply belief systems. Because uh, scientists are also humans, and they have their own preconceptions, and their own uh, ideologies. So it, it can take uh, some time to uh, uh, create a new uh, scientific revolution. That's what happens, usually. Uh, but all this evidence that I've presented clearly demonstrate that scientific materialism, the, all the metaphysical assumptions that I showed you at the beginning, uh, it's obsolete. And I didn't have the time to present all the evidence because uh, you have evidence also, uh, very interesting research done with research mediums, credible research medium. You have reincarnation research, which is very serious, done by uh, Jim Tucker, for instance, at the University of Virginia, Erlander, Haraldson, and Iceland, uh, and so on and so forth. And we have to remember about this that quantum physics has invalidated most of the metaphysical assumptions of scientific materialism, but it's like if scientists in all the other fields, except for physics, they don't seem to be aware of that, or they don't want to see this. But clearly, it's time to enlarge our concept of the natural world and to embrace a post-materialist paradigm. And last year, at, uh, in Tucson, I co-organized a meeting about uh, this topic. And following the meeting, and there were a number of uh, famous scientists attending the meeting, including uh, British biologist Rupert Sheldrake, we, uh, we wrote a manifesto for a post-materialist science. And uh, since we posted it, uh, it's been signed by a few hundred uh, scientists. And uh, so you have lot, many scientists who dare now challenge clearly the old materialist uh, orthodoxy. More clearly, usually it's young people or famous scientists uh, who are not at the university anymore or who are emeritus professors. And we also created a, uh, a website called the, uh, open, cam cam the, the Campaign for Open Science. So it's a campaign for a non-dogmatic, open-minded science, as it should be. And so when we talk about this emerging paradigm, uh, it, this paradigm, it uh, recognizes the reality of matter. And we celebrate the progress made by uh, materialist science. But we simply posit that there's a greater reality, which includes matter, energy, and formation, but also mind, consciousness, spirit. And so uh, we also recognize the fundamental role played by mind and consciousness in nature and cosmos and the cosmos. And um, we're convinced that the shift from materialist science to post-materialist science will be extremely important. Perhaps it will be as important as uh, the passage from uh, geocentrism to heliocentrism. And if you want to learn more about this new or this upcoming scientific revolution, uh, I created a new web TV channel that will start in September. It's called Expanding Reality TV. It's about science, consciousness, and spirituality. So, uh, it's not only science, it's, uh, but it presents the work of visionary scientists, uh, but also the work of visionary activists in all spheres of human activity, uh, like, for instance, um, medicine and health, uh, economy, ecology, uh, and so on and so forth. And the ultimate goal of this is to contribute to the creation of a better world. I thank you for your attention.